and eight. And Kawasaki's line has prevailed at Binghamton and triumphantly hoist another number one plate. With the 250s all but wrapped up, the real dramas in the 125 class. With two races left, the battle is between Mike Brown and Grant Langston. Langston left Millville, the new points leader. But the fierce rivalry between the former world champion and Tennessee's own heats up here today. With Travis Pastrana out for the season, who will vote across as the champion B once the smoke clears of the 2001 season? Stay tuned. Round 11 from upstate New York is next on Speed World. everyone and welcome to round 11 of the Chevy Trucks AMA Motocross Championships from Broom Tioga Sports Center in Binghamton, New York. It is an absolute perfect day for the showdown in the 125 class between Grant Langston and Mike Brown. Art Eckman, David Bailey and Davey Coombs ready to bring you the action on this very exciting day of motocross action. The South African with four wins to Brown's three on the season. Grant Langston on the KTM, trying to become the first non-American citizen to win a 125 American Championship. He's also trying to be the first to put a European bike atop the point standings. Number 111 leads Mike Brown by three points. Also a note on the Suzuki point standings, Larry Ward has a chance to catch Travis Pastrana for third place. Let's go to Davey Combs. Well, that's it, Art. Three points. It comes down to those two guys right back there. Grant Langston with 372, Mike Brown with 369. We've had battles this close before. Just last year, Travis Pastrana and Stefan Roncana. But you know what? This year it seems different. It seems more intense. Four motos to go. Three points separate them. It could go right down to the wire. Ricky Carmichael interested in the action as we take a look at the Suzuki starting grid. Grant Langston, Mike Brown battling it out for the title with Larry Ward and Ernesto Fonseca in a battle there for third place along with the departed. Travis Pastrana, Brock Sellard, Nathan Ramsey. Brandon Jessamine having a good ending to his 125 season and Roderick Kane coming back after injury. Scott Sheik, David Huffman, Greg Schnell, Kelly Smith all putting in fine isolated performances this year. As the 125s get ready, we look at the other participants. Doug Henry, and he's on a two-stroke Yamaha. That should prove interesting. Steve Lampson on the Husqvarna, the former two-time 125 champion. Ricky Carmichael can't stay away from that starting gate. Now he's real interested in what it takes to keep Brown motivated and anything he can pay notice. And having that perspective of looking at this class from the outside, he's sharing all that stuff with Brown. They ride together during the week, and Brown's got an advantage there. Kawasaki hoping for a 125-250 sweep this year. Mike Brown has to get by Grant Langston, though. They're right together here on the starting pad. See the stars on the back of Langston and Brown. Four wins for Langston, three for Brown. A little meaner in the 250 class. They represent those with a skull and crossbones. A four-stroke Larry Ward right next to Brown. Let's see who gets the break. It wasn't Larry Ward. Langston on the inside. Langston's got the early lead. Oh, Nick Way goes tumbling over the, the hay bales. But out in front, Grant Langston with Mike Brown in good position. Well, he's hung up in the fence right there. Tough year for Nick Way, and he's still looking for a ride. That won't help. Jessamine and Tane also right there with good starts. Number 31 is Jessamine moving into second place. This is perfect for Grant Langston to have the lead this early and to have some privateers back there in second. Just sort of postpone Brown's arrival because he will show up at the front. He's motivated. Langston coming into this round with terrific momentum. A second place at Washougal. A 1-1 sweep win at Millville in the last race. There you see Brown in sixth place. There's no way he's gonna stay there. He's gonna ride on the edge until he catches Langston. Work, huh? Not sure what that's supposed to mean. Well, both Langston and Brown, you can't get tougher workers. No, they work hard. He's looking back just to see. All he cares about is that green guy back there with number 100 all that matters and the more riders he sees between himself and brown the better he just a little loses the front end back there just a little bit but it didn't affect him but you see on the track as well 
It's good to be out in front here because of the rocks. Very similar to Unadilla. They're not too far away from each other. The guy's wearing chest protectors. They've got the, the hand guards. Langston wearing his under the jersey. No hand guards. That's confidence. Doesn't really like to ride. It affects the way the bike looks, like changing the front fender on your bike. It just, the front of the bike looks different. Feels like it handles different. It takes some getting used to. So he's just decided, hey, I'm going to get the whole shot and not have to worry about it when he drops. Many of the teams experimenting with the moose type tires, too. There's Mike Brown moving up the third already. Getting around uh, Fonseca, number 25. And there he's got Jessamine. Brown versus Jessamine. Brown cuts him off quickly. Well, Jessamine made a little bit of a mistake, and since Brown wasn't following, he went right around him, and he didn't really mean to cut him off. That was just the best line. Once he was ahead, he could go wherever he wanted. Obviously, Mike Brown's mechanic with the pit board had something else written on the board before he moved into third place. And now into second place. Well, I don't believe how fast Brown was able to get to, when Langston turns around. Look at that contact back there. Jessamine and Fonseca. Fonseca number 25 of the Yamaha Troy. 4 one action. Boy, the scene is set for a great one. Chevy Trucks AMA Motocross is brought to you by Chevy Trucks, the most dependable, long-lasting trucks on the road. And by Honda, the company that defines performance in motorcycles, ATVs, and scooters. Back to the action here with the opening 125 moto, and the two contenders are one and two. Grant Langston, number 111 on the KTM, as they ride by Roger DeCoster of Suzuki. It's the Kawasaki of number 100, the Pro Circuit Kawasaki of Mike Brown, now starting to really put pressure on Langston. If you're Langston right here, you've got to be a little bit nervous about Brown being behind you because you've seen how aggressive he is. Langston looks over at him. He knows he caught him fast. That makes you nervous right there, but the aggressive style of Brown. Brown to the inside. Oh, a little rubbing on the plastic. Blake Brown takes over the lead here in the opening lap. What a move. That was impressive. Just kind of, look at this. He's waving him on. <laughs> I don't believe it. A little bit of Rocky movie stuff. You ain't so bad. Hey, come on. Where are you? I can't believe it's not so much the move, but... But the fact that he was able to get up to Langston as fast as he did, and Langston is ready to turn it up. He'll learn from Brown's lines and go right back at him. Langston to the inside, almost right on that rear rubber of Mike Brown. Langston looking for the opportunity to retake the lead. This rivalry, which started in Europe, with Langston, they're touching again. More to bar. Brown looks over. Well, Brown asked for it. And, you know? and he got it start getting cute with those gestures and you're just asking for trouble and Langston is the kind of guy that can give you some. Both riders dreaming with confidence. Surprised they haven't dropped third yet. Look at this again. Now this pass, see Langston looks over. He knows he's coming. He didn't leave much room. Watch it. Look at how high Brown's foot is. That's how close to the inside is the only way he could get through there. He's probably a little bit bummed that Langston didn't lose more time right there to go off the track because he went in there with full intentions of making contact. Mitch Payton of Pro Circuit Kawasaki. Mike Brown has been his standard bearer after an off-season, really, of Supercross action with so many of Mitch's riders getting injured. He's so glad to have a guy like Mike Brown who tries so hard. He's got such an aggressive, that Brian Hughes-type style, but he's steady. One item that makes this rivalry so interesting, I think, it's the battle of the ages because number 100 Mike Brown is 10 years older than the 19-year-old South African, Brad Langston. Take a look at the track. Well, today the finish line has been moved to right after the first corner there. It's just after the mechanics area, one corner sooner than usual. And today, Davey Coombs takes us around on one of Mitch Payton's fights. Into a slow left-hander here. Oh, he's a little pilot. Up oh, double. Breathing through right now, but later on, there'll be rust all over that thing. Now, here's the big downhill double. They got to jump out of the darkness almost. Down this side. 
into a sweeper here. Now the super cluster. This stuff's all pretty easy for these guys. When you're my age, not so easy. So we try another line on this guy. Now here's we come out of the open. There's two ways you can do it. Far inside, far outside. I'll try the far inside, the shorter line. So look at the breaking bumps up here. And get down the bottom, it's a big kicker. Little off camber. Right hander, switch back left. Roll around here. Now back into the real part, where it gets hard. They have a real big tail up here. It's actually pretty easy to do. However, by the end of the day, it won't be so easy. Back to the action in our first moto. Mike Brown has taken over the lead in the first lap from Langston, but Langston has stayed right with him, adding pressure the entire distance. Down the hill they go. Let's go to Davey. Well, Andrew, I think it's pretty safe to say it's on. Oh, for sure. Uh, we said it was going to go down to the last race. Uh, Graham was looking good this morning in uh, practice. It was a little bit faster than Brown. Uh, he got the start. Brown came through quickly, and I think he closed on him really quickly. And uh, giving Grant a bit of a wake-up call, but he's in there, and I think he's going to hang in there for a while, and we'll see what comes. Well, with the title on the line, so much prestige for both factories as well as riders. And uh, really, Mike Brown has to have this first one. That'll make things interesting going into the second. Well, if he wins it, it's a three-point gap back to second. They'll be tied. Brown has to have this moto to stay in this championship and to let Grant know, hey, I can get right back up here and tie this thing. So Mike Brown and Grant Langston, the two title contenders are going at it with Jessamyn and Fonseca, three and four. back to upstate New York. It's round 11 of the 12 round AMA motocross series. Number 19, Doug Henry back on a bike. It's good to see him on the track. He's on a two-stroke Yamaha this time in the 125 division. The other race this year, his home track, he took an eighth on a four-stroke in the 250 class. Well, there was a time when Doug dominated this 125 class the way Langston and Brown are doing out front, but it takes a long time to get used to that 125. You can come back and step onto a bike with a little bit more power. It's not quite as difficult as it is to step onto a 125 where the pace is higher. you got to have a lot more energy and, and aggressiveness to keep that thing on the bike. The former two-time champion on a Honda. And then came back to the 250 championship. Whoa, on a Yamaha later on. Brandon Jessamine. And he's not moving. That's the big plateau. Davey talked about being pretty easy when he was doing it. He said it would get tougher as the day progressed. Brandon Jessamine, a victim of awful starts in the early part of the season, finally gets a good start, and now he's down. This is the time of year, too, when Brandon really shines. Seems to always be a good closer. This is really going to mess that up. The battle for third, Fonseca currently owns that position. He's on a Yamaha four-stroke. Lot retained behind him. There's Fonseca's mechanic, Kenny Germain. It looks like Fonseca will be going to Honda next year. And from what I hear so far, it looks like his mechanic, Kenny, is going to get to go with him. Oh, that's a good combination. Hard worker, Kenny Germain. Let's check in on the uh, condition of Jessamine. How about it, Davey? Guys, take a look. The golf car you see moving around, that's Brandon Jessamine sitting in the passenger seat. Jessamine caught a lip over there on the big tabletop. He was trying to scrub speed like you've been seeing Langston do. And unfortunately, he caught something on the jump, came up and bit him. A huge flying W out of the race for Brandon Jessamine. Here's Tang in fourth, starting to put some pressure on Ernesto Fonseca. Fonseca's had a good ride so far. He's been pretty steady, and this is the kind of track where I think the four-stroke would really do well. All the torque and that loam, all the extra sawdust, and the loam they put on this track, it's a little bit harder for a 125 to dig through that than it is for a four-stroke. Ernesto with his best motocross in his career at Troy earlier this year, finishing up in second overall. Davies with Taint's mechanic, 
Tony, we're just watching Hot Rod. He's flying once again, man. The last few weeks have been amazing for you guys. Yeah, for sure. He's really uh, stepped it up. You know, he's. Uh, I'm pretty happy with him. I think he's uh, excited. He likes this track, and this is running good. So I think we're looking pretty good. How depressed were you guys when he hurt that shoulder at Southwick? I mean, up to that point, he was fourth in the standings. Yeah, I was really bummed, you know, and he, we missed uh, three races, and we only got like three race, or three points at Southwick, so that really hurt us, but uh, we're back in the top ten now, and uh, we're looking to try to get seventh overall. I think that's about as far as we go, but he's, he's really pushing for seventh overall in the championship. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, David. You know, four races ago, he was in 16th position, and Roderick Payne, after two podiums, two third-place finishes, is now tied for eighth in the points. Payne starting to get real close to Fonseca now. The Suzuki two-stroke versus the Yamaha four-stroke. Well, besides the fact that I like the pressure that he's putting on Fonseca right now, trying to create an opportunity for himself, he's got a purpose. You know, a lot of these guys are just riding out the season. And even Fonseca, you know, I'm not putting him down or anything, but I know he's just kind of looking forward to 2002, going, okay, you know, what's that red team going to be like? And, and at least Tane's going, okay, seventh, which may not sound that impressive. It's a goal. And you need to have that when you go racing. Fonseca doing a little slipping and sliding. Tane looking for opportunity. Tane going to the outside. It's a good battle for third. Out in front, it's Frank Brown. And Brent Langston, the two title contenders. Photo number one, 125 action. Our leaders, Mike Brown of Pro Circuit Kawasaki, and number 111 right behind him. Brent Langston on the KTM is starting to uh, get serious about maybe retaking the lead that he had in the early part of the first lap. I've talked about this strategy before, and this may be what's going on with Langston right now. He's just waiting, trying to stay close enough, keep the pressure on, and bother Brown until the very end where he can make a pass and not give Brown the time to retaliate. Coming up on a lap rider, Mike Brown, looking pretty steady. Just soaking up that roof, too. Those, those rocks hurt. Just those wood chips hurt. Throw some rocks in with that, and Langston's getting it all. But he's got to stay that close to have a chance to take advantage of anything that Brown might do wrong here. Pressure him into a mistake, or if he leaves the door open somewhere, he's got to be Whoa! Closer. Brownie making a mistake. Let's go to Davey. And uh, it looks like Grant has started to pick up the pace. Yeah, he's starting to ride good. Uh, when Brownie caught up to him, I think it put him out a little. Um, he's re -gripped, found himself again. He's finding some good lines out there. I think he's just uh, biding his time and he's going to wait till the end and then make his move, I hope. We've seen Mike make a little bit of contact. Do we expect the same from Grant towards the end of the race if he gets a shot? You know, Grant's only going to dish out what's given to him. You know, if Mike rides good and hard, Grant's going to ride the same. But if Mike starts uh, using dirty tactics, Grant's just going to do the same back to him. Thanks. That's the way it should be, you know, race clean, but if there's, that's how it was in my day. Of course, we had some pretty gnarly T-bones and takeouts and on purpose putting guys over the fence, but, you know, you didn't do that until it really mattered. It came down to something like this, final lap or whatever for a championship, and then once you get it done to you, you're giving it back. You saw the white flag. This is the final lap. Where will Langston try to make a move on Mike Brown? Brownie's had the lead and held it nicely ever since early in the first lap. Brown coming from 59 points down to compete for this championship. Oh, Langston! Brownie goes down. The uh, front wheel kicked by the Langston as he came by. That surprises me a little bit. Two things leading up to that. Brown didn't jump that entire tabletop, and he went wide in the corner. So. Although Langston came across and deliberately hit him, Brown, he left the door open. Same thing Fonseca did when Brown took him out in uh, Redbud earlier in the season. Watch right here. Brown goes wide. See the berm right here that Langston's in? That's where Brown should have gone. That's where Langston needs to go, but he's like, forget it. I'll go over that, cut off the line of Brown, and if he goes down, well, that's just too bad. Remember, Brown made contact with Langston early in the race for the lead. Probably wishes that Langston would have gone down now. 
So Grant Langston retaking the lead on the final lap. Came into this race leading by only three points. Would pick up three more if it finishes just the way we have it now. I'll tell you what, if this continues, this rivalry, especially now you got Ricky Carmichael in the middle of it. He's on the starting line for the 250s coming up next, but you know he's, Ricky can be a dirty rider. He's probably instilling a little bit of that in Brown, going, don't give that guy an inch, man. Take him out. And if he would have done it a little bit more aggressive, as a matter of fact, in this corner right here early in the race, he wouldn't have had Langston to contend with there at the end. So it's kind of do unto others before they do unto you. A ninth moto win for Langston. One of the interesting factors during this season is that Langston and Brown had rounds where they secured no points at all. Now they might go a couple rounds in the pits. I wouldn't be surprised if it came to that. The checkers for Langston. Langston now with three straight photo wins down the back stretch, and uh, Mike Brown securing second, drops three more points behind him. So Brownie going into that second moto here in the second to the last race of the season will be six points down to Grant Langston. There's Langston, Brown, Fonseca holding on to third place, Ramsey moving up, and Larry Ward rounding out the top five. Let's hear from Brownie. Mikey, I'm the whole way. What happened? I uh, just got outside over a stupid move for me, but... Uh, I don't know what to say, you know? Stupid move. How about the second moto? I mean, you get a chance to retaliate, redeem yourself. That's a heck of a way to lose a national championship fight like this. Yeah, it sure is. You know, it's, that's three points I lost. I could have been tied, but that's all right. I'm ready to go. Uh, I got good starts. My Bridgestone hooked up, got off the gate. My Kawasaki's running awesome. I just stepped to me now. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Meanwhile, Grant Langston comes out on top as the emotions continue to boil in this championship race. Let's go back to David. Grant, that was an amazing race. What happened on the last lap? I mean, I got real close. Every time that little section, I seemed to gain on him, and uh, you now he hit me real hard in the beginning of the race, and, uh, you know, that's how he rides real aggressive, and, uh, you know, I just returned the favor on the last lap. He let the door open. I came up the inside. He hit my rear wheel, and, uh, you know, that's how racing goes. He would have done the same thing, and uh, I just have to pull off the win. As far as the second moto goes, do you expect him to come back firing? Oh, definitely. I mean, he always rides like that, and, you know, he'll hit me again and again if he gets a chance. And, uh, you know, that's, that's aggressive racing, so uh, that's how racing goes. We both want to win, and, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't get dirty. Well, I'll let you go prepare for that moto. Thanks for that. Meanwhile, the good steady ride for number 25 on the Yamaha four-stroke, Ernesto Fonseca. Ernesto hanging on to that third spot in the first photo, baby. Well, Ernesto, it seemed like you spent that whole moto fighting with Roderick Thane. Yeah, I think that was uh, one of the things that kept me going. Uh, I think it would have been worse if I was by myself, but uh, it definitely helps somebody to push you from behind, and I think uh, it worked. At the end of the moto, your teammate Nathan Ramsey came up on you. That was almost a photo finish. Yeah, it was close, and I think I needed those points, so I was going for it. Kind of a ballsy move, but, you know, that's racing. Good ride, Ernesto. Thanks. Up next on the gate, the 250s, where Ricky Carmichael is looking for his fifth consecutive national motocross title. Can he do it? We'll find out when we come back. Either Direct TV or Dish Network. For the first time since 1996-97, we've got a chance to see a rider win back-to-back -back 250 titles. Ricky Carmichael right there, focusing, getting ready for this 11th round in the 12-round series. He can already wrap up the 250 title. Kevin Windham proved at Washougal that the former four-time winner in 250 motocross is back into contending status. They're next to each other on the gate, David Bailey, but I don't think they've looked at each other one time. Well, Kevin for sure has not not even close to even acknowledge the fact that Ricky's even sitting there. A couple times Ricky's looked over at him and he hasn't gotten much back, so now he's just keeping to himself. Been quite a season for young Tim Ferry as well in third place on the Suzuki point standing. There you see the 50 point spread, Ricky Carmichael and Kevin Windham. John Dowd, the top privateer. The spotlight though on number four, Ricky Carmichael for five consecutive years. Can he win at least 
seven national events. It's never been done before, Davey. Well, this is it. Ricky Carmichael stands on the edge of history once again. This time he's got a 50-point lead on Kevin Windham. All he has to do is beat him straight up today to win his fifth straight outdoor national title, three in the 125 class, two in the 250 class. Windham, number 14, the only person with a mathematical chance, but I think right now the two newly named Team USA teammates are just going to go out and see who can win this race and forget about the championship. Only twice Ricky Carmichael has not made the podium this year. Once a lowly fourth, and the other one in fifth. As we take a look at the Suzuki starting grid, Carmichael, Wyndham, Tim Ferry. Ferry, probably the most improved rider on the circuit this year. Sebastian Tortelli trying to recover from a concussion. And uh, David Villeman, Ezra Lust, looks like he's going to Kawasaki next year. The privateer Robbie Raynard with Travis Preston. As we go down the rest of the 40-rider field. Here for the 250s in Binghamton, New York. They had a little bit of a holdup a while back. You saw Ricky with the goggles on. He took them back off. Now they got things fired up. The goggles back on. They're warming the tires. And that inside spot has proven to be pretty good. I, last time I raced here, I started their both motos. Hole shot at both times. That's where Langston and Brown were placed. Ricky Carmichael and Kevin Woodham trying to keep the back tire warm. And we're ready to go. Photo number one of the 250 is underway. Carmichael, a great start on the inside. And John Dowd, who got both pole shots in the last race to the outside, but he slips and slides. And Carmichael takes the early lead. Look out. He's in good position now with Tortelli right behind him. Kevin Windham, number 14. Dowd on the right. He's number 16. 17 is Bobby Rainer. Good clean start for the 250s. Carmichael in front of Tortelli. Oh, Carmichael, this little wash out there coming down the hill hot. Laying it into the corner. Now look at these guys. They jumped that whole plateau. Ricky's got his hands full right behind him. The two, other than Ferry, perhaps, the two fastest guys on the circuit, Tortelli and Wyndham, they're not going to let him get away. They're going to try not to anyway, but that's what he's been doing all year. These guys are getting desperate, though. Tortelli's been on the podium five times this year, but he's had a few races that have just taken him right out of contention. Listen to Ricky, just wide open. I mean, I, I keep saying that like it's something new, but it just amazes me how fast this guy goes and how much he's on the power all the time, even in the bumps. The off camber, all the rocks flying, and Ricky already is starting to pull a big lead. That's wide open. I mean, down that hill to be, to have your bike sounding like that, and believe me, that bike is potent. It takes so much strength to be able to keep that bike going exactly in the line you want. Still Tortelli in second. There you saw Ferry in front of Dowd. Dowd had a pretty good start, but drifting wide like that in the first corner, you really give up a lot of spots. It looks like he gave up a couple more in this first lap. Raynard right there, getting ahead of Ferry. Raynard kind of getting warmed up for that race at Del Monte, where he's had a lot of good luck. He's had a lot of success at Del Monte. Another look. Yeah, he does a little downshift right before that last little burst of the throttle. He's never in the wrong gear. It surprises me a little bit that he's able to have the bike sounding that good all the time because he doesn't. he's one of the few guys in the circuit that doesn't leave his fingers out there on the clutch all the time. Wyndham, Rainer, and there's Ferry, number 15. Uh, that's an inside line. Here comes a possible move with Ferry on Robbie Rainer. Oh, Ferry held that line so tight up there that I know how hard that is to do. I mean, he's actually fast through there. Usually when you hold it that tight, you got to creep around there a little bit. He made up time. Robbie Raynard off to one of his better starts. His final, his best overall performance this year was at Bud's Creek. He took a seventh overall. Well, that's a technical track. And here we are again at a technical track. The, the harder, the better for Raynard. He likes to be able to have to pick lines and think a little bit more. Right there, Barry just out thought him going down to that that line. He had a little bit, bit better power on that four-stroke to hold a tight line up the hill to set that up, but I really like Raynard's riding ability. It's just that looking at the tracks nowadays, and I talked about how beautiful this place is, and there's less rocks, 
there's more loam on it. It's, but they're not as rough as they used to be. Those big bumps going down that hill, it used to be like that all the way down there. I could break out a video from 1984, five, six. And this track it didn't look as nice as it looks now, and that would have been a lot better for a guy like Robbie. Well, Ricky Carmichael really hasn't uh, pulled way out in front of Sebastian Tortelli yet. But Carmichael dominates here in the first photo of the 250s. We'll be right back with more action from upstate New York in a moment. Attention. The preceding space was a demonstration of the KX domination system. In the event of an actual race, it would have been followed by the rolling crowd and the new champ holding an oversized cardboard check. For further instructions and information, contact the authorities at Kawasaki.com or 1-800-661-RIDE. You might think all alarm clock radios are the same, but when the power goes out... Found the Welcome back to Binghamton, New York. Art Eckman, David Bailey, Davey Coombs bringing you the action. Ricky Carmichael looking to nail down his second consecutive 250 outdoor championship. He's probably mad right now that Tortelli is still this close. Ricky likes to come from way behind or else get out front and even in the first couple of laps just disappear. Anytime somebody can hang with you for a little while like this, gives them a little bit of hope. Ricky doesn't want to give anybody any hope. He doesn't want to give anybody anything. He just crushed McGrath this year, and he's done it to everybody in the outdoors. And he doesn't want to end his season by giving these guys anything they can believe in going into next year. Tortelli's last podium was Unadilla when he took a second place. He won the overall at Hangtown, and it showed great speed at times. But there's a lot of bad luck, a few mistakes, some bike problems as well. And he's always fighting from behind, it seems like. Yeah, he's had a really tough year. And, and I really thought he had a good year coming to him, you know? I'm still, I still think he should just get rid of that number. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Number 13, Tortelli starting the season with a second at Glen Helen. Got his win in the second round and a third at Mount Morris. He was in the points lead by six points. He's been in the points lead of this series every year for the last three years at some time during the series. Yeah, never when it matters most. And a lot of the guys know that. Little bobble right there, and you know what? You don't get that back. Ricky will pull out about a half a second because of that mistake and keep it. And Kevin Windham right behind him will pick up some time. Yeah, Tortelli just looks up the track, and you can see Carmichael inching away. So that puts him in a, a position to be even a little bit more desperate, try even harder. And that's when those kind of mistakes show up. And you're riding a little bit beyond your capability. There's Ferry and Ford. Real impressed with him this year. Ever since that race in Salt Lake, uh, you know, he was on the radar screen before that, but that's where he really was on my mind. The, the kind of race he had there, he had a good shot at winning that thing. Now getting a little sideways right there, got on the power too early, but ever since Salt Lake, then coming into Vegas when, when McGrath and Carmichael had their great battle out front, you know, no one really cared about what was going on behind him, but it was Ferry in third, scooped up that to the podium, and he's been strong ever since. There goes down number 16. You hear the guttural sound of that four-stroke. Let's check in with Racer X's Davey Coles. Joining us for this week's Kawasaki Bike Setup from Broom Tiger is Dan Worley, the factory mechanic for Stefan Roncotta. Dan, what do you have going for this week? Well, with the ruts and rocks at Broom Tioga, we're going to have to run a 20-inch wheel with increased tire pressure to help keep the wheel in the ruts, but still good on the slippery stuff. Next one, at least, with the big downhills, got to stiffen up the suspension to make sure the bike tracks straight. And with the rocks and ruts, once again, we're going to have to run a double wall pipe just to help keep the pipe safe from getting dented. How are the rocks out there? Actually, this year they've done a really good job, but they're going to come up as the race goes on. All right, better safe than sorry. That's Dan Worley with this week's Kawasaki Bike Setup. Oh, he's got a career in broadcast, maybe. Yeah, Dan does a good job at that. Sometimes the mechanics get a little nervous. You know, they're like, oh, I wish I could do that over. His rider, Stefan Roncata, you see here behind Rainer. You know, Roncata's first year in the 250, his Supercross, I expected him to do a little bit better than he did, but outdoors, it's right about where he should be, just at the tail end of all the really good guys, getting the experience he needs to be a contender next year. 
His third place at Unit Villa, his best result of this season. We'll be right back. Think now. Chevy Trucks AMA Motocross is brought to you by Yamaha, makers of fine motorcycles and ATVs. Nobody's more in tune with motorsports than Yamaha. Back to the action here in our first 250 moto from Binghamton, New York. Ricky Carmichael continues to lead the battle right here. And right now is with Robbie Rainer, number 17. He's got John Dowd right behind him on the KTM 520. Looks like Raynard's chest protector strap may have come undone and something flapping there. And if that's the case, it bothers you a little bit. That 520 has got some power. Look at the gap he closes right there. Sets up the path, too. That's the same place as Ferry was able to work his way around Raynard. Raynard needs to cover that line a little bit better. If he's at a disadvantage with power, he needs to cover that inside a little bit. Make him pass him somewhere else. Kevin Wyndham and John Dowd have won both at this track of 125s and 250s, and John Dowd has taken two 250 races here. That was in 94 and 97. So this is one of Dowdy's favorites. Wyndham around that tree over that downhill double. Beautiful, perfect timing, a little better than Ferry. Ferry ducking for the roost clear back there. Places in this track where you can see all those rocks popping up, that'll get worse throughout the day, and that roost will hurt. If Kevin drops his position to Ferry, he's going to feel it. Kevin has worked tremendously hard this year, shaking the uncertainties from his mind to really post an outstanding season. His worst finish of the season is sixth. That was only because his bike threw a, threw a chain while he was running second. Let's go to Davey. Allie, we're watching Kevin running third, first of all. Barry's right behind him, moving hard. Yeah, I don't know uh, what his what his deal is. He just slowed down. He was uh, running 211s and he went up to 214s. Now I don't know what happened. Well, that was going to be my second question. He's let go of Carmichael and Sortelli. Yeah, I, I guess those guys are on it, and he must be off a little bit. Yeah, I sure like Allie's attitude. He's he's got a good poker face. He does get that little grin when Kevin's doing well, but. You know, for being an ex-rider, you expect to see him out there with a pit board yelling and screaming like Paul Delorier or something, but he's pretty calm. <laughs> Kevin Windham holding off Tim Ferry well. Well, Kevin caught him pretty quick, but it looks like Kevin has responded to it going, you know, I don't want to get roosted by that four-stroke, or I need these points. You know, he can put himself in a position for the overall if he can stay up there in third. Once he drops to fourth, he pretty much give that up. For those of you just joining us here in the first moto of the 250 action, the winner of the first 125 moto was Grant Langston on the last lap. Mike Brown in second. An all-exciting second moto coming up after this one as Ricky Carmichael simply dominates here in our first 250 moto with Portelli now starting to slip back. Wyndham Ferry Roncata rounding out the top five on our field summary. Well, you really see the difference in aggressiveness and... You know, when you go from the battle with Ferry and Wyndham, they're, they're riding great, they're doing everything smooth, but when you go to Ricky, man, it's just another pace. There have been 11 riders win 250 titles in Supercross and Motocross in the same year. Ricky's trying to do that, of course, right now. But when it gets down to the elite numbers, when you add the Motocross the Nation's title to the mix, only Hannah, Jeff Ward, Rick Johnson, and David Bailey won both 250 titles and a Motocross title in the same calendar year. Well, good. That's one record. That little creep hasn't passed me in yet. <laughs> I'm sure he probably will catch me, though. Johnny O'Mara was invited to test ride Honda's 2002 bikes. He's the subject of our Honda profile. Well, we got a special invite to uh, try the new 2002 Honda 125, and was very excited to uh, be the guy they chose to uh, do the riding on it today. Uh, the whole intake system, air box, air boot, carburetor, reed valve. I tell you, I liked it. Um, you know, I've always been a 125 specialist, so uh, you know, anytime I get a chance to ride anything new, that's you know, kind of before anyone rode it, um, it feels super good. I was uh, very impressed with the suspension, the handling, uh, the cornering. Um, wish I had something like that in my day, you know, like 15 years ago when I was racing, but. It was, it was very good. I was truly impressed with uh, the bike of 2002. We've added both ends of the power band, more bottom, more top. 
Uh, we've decreased the weight by six pounds. I tell you, I'm really impressed with the handling. Um, that's came a long way since my day, so uh, probably put that on the top of the list. The handling's just phenomenal. You can just seems like you could about hit anything, and they're more forgiving than they were in our day. We've changed the uh, chassis uh, flex and rigidity, and so it's a little softer on bump impacts. Suspension, braking, uh, cornering. Stability is, you got everything now. It's, it's a great package for your, for about anybody that's going to ride these days, uh, up from a beginner to a novice and immediate professional. It's, it's all there. And um, just pretty much the, everything is different about the bike except the transmission. I would have liked to have something like this, but you know, I was part of the generation that gave the guys what they have today is part part to do with the guys uh, like myself and Barnett and Wardy and Glover and those guys that, you know, we kind of paved the road, you know, for the guys now. You could tell that if he rode a lot right now, he could get right back in there. No, no, no comeback. I'm, uh, I'm over that. I just leave it at that. Good old memories from the past. Welcome back to 250 action in the penultimate round of the AMA Chevy Trucks Motocross Championships. And it's Ricky Carmichael trying to win the title before that final race, as he's done several times. Lapping Travis Preston right there. Must feel pretty awkward for these guys that are close to the top 10 to be getting lapped by Ricky well before the end of the race and they have them fly over their head like that over stuff that you struggle to just jump the way they're jumping it. I can remember that having the good guys come by me when I was just getting into the professional ranks just feeling like, man, I'm never going to be that good. Well, RC, if he wins this race, would be tied with Jeff Ward and uh, Rick Johnson, second on the all-time AMA national title list for championships. Brock Glover is atop that list with six national titles. The way Ricky's going and the AG is, I wouldn't be surprised to see him top that. Earlier, we got his impressions about raising the bar with a possible fifth consecutive motocross championship. I think five national championships in a row would be excellent to, to put in my book of championships. Uh, it's, it's a lot of winning races and a lot of pain and suffering, that's for sure. Uh, you know, I think outdoors is really tough mentally and really, really tough physically. The tracks are so rough these days and the competition is getting so tough. And if I'm able to wrap this fifth one up in a row, it uh, would mean a lot to me. You know? and I, I consider myself a better outdoor rider than Supercross rider. I don't know why, but uh, five titles would be unbelievable. I don't know, David, is it safe to assume that He'll win the title this year, and, and we've seen some bizarre things happen in motocross. Yeah, but he's got such a good lead now and such a cushion. Plus, you know, when you look at a rider on a roll like this, and I, I just I can't imagine anything bad creeping into his program. Everything has gone his way all year, indoors and out, and I can't imagine that stopping anytime soon. Probably some of the other riders thinking somewhere along the line he's going to have some bad luck. It usually goes the other way. Checkered flag for Ricky Carmichael. Winning the first moto here at Binghamton. A first step taken to winning another championship. 13, Tortelli holding on to second place in front of Wyndham. And it was Tim Ferry and Stefan Roncata rounding out the top five. Not a race that Mike Morocco really wants to remember. Let's go down now to Racer X's Davy Coombs. Ricky, that was a very impressive start to finish win. Thanks a lot, Dave. I tell you, the British Sun tires hooked up great off the concrete start. I tell you, I look back and I seen Sebastian and Kevin, and uh, we are the three guys that's been uh, doing pretty good this series, other than Sebastian had a couple bad races lately, and uh, it was good to see him up there. He was riding really good, and he kept me honest. Uh, glad to, there was a guy in between me and Kevin for the points. That's right, and speaking of the points, Kevin got third. All you need is a third in the next moto, and you have your fifth straight national championship. Well, I tell you, Davey, I need to go out there and uh, try to do the best that I can and get another good start like that, and uh, hopefully I don't make any mistakes and my bike stays together and uh, try to get another championship. But those guys are riding really good today, and uh, I tell you, I had to ride hard the whole race. Good ride, Ricky. Thanks a lot, Davey. Of his 13 moto wins, eight 
have come on event sweeps. One wonders if he can do it again today. Tortelli in second place. And a good steady ride for Sebastian. For well, Sebastian, we watched the whole moto. The lead between you and Ricky barely fluctuated. Four, five, six seconds. For his first couple laps, he got you. Yeah, you know, Ricky was great out there. You know, he was running great. And I just gave the best I had out there. And you, I mean, I guess he has some better lines. And I don't think about it for the second moto and try to come back and be faster than what I was. I can tell that you're completely over your concussion now after what we saw at Washougal. Looks like Sebastian Tortelli's 100% again. Yeah, I know. Uh, Connor Millville was my first race back, and I got some bad starts, so I couldn't show my, my speed. But you know, today, you know, I feel great. And, you know, my trainer, uh, Yannick Kervelai, and all the team, you know, my, my mechanic, Shandrew, everybody is doing a great job, you know. And so we're pushing hard until the end of the season, and hopefully they are going to help. They're going to be good for the Super Bowl season. All right, good luck in the second moto. Thank you. 125s at the gate, and the rivalry rages on. Mike Brown losing the lead in the last lap to Grant Langston in the first moto, taking a second place, now moving six points behind the points lead. Here's how it happened. The second moto will revenge take place. With only three motos left on the season in the 125 action, this moto, the second 125 moto at Binghamton, New York, is vitally important in the points race to Mike Brown and Grant Langston. Langston right there on the KTM next to Mike Brown as we get set for our second moto. Langston leads by only six points over Brown. Langston on the inside. Ramsey on the outside, along with Ward. Langston came out of it, looked like second place. Yes, he's right behind. And there's Brown. Brown bar to bar. Brown got aced out on the start, but he's right back, and he passes Langston into second place. Whoa, what a move by Mike Brown. Brown behind Ramsey, and Larry Ward has taken third. Here comes Brown to the inside. Mike Brown takes the lead. Let's go to Davey Coase. Thanks, guys. I'm down here with AMA Pro Motocross Manager Duke Finch. Duke, I know you had a private meeting with Mike Brown and Grant Langston. What did you tell them? Uh, I told the guys, let's go out and race uh, rather than bouncing off one another. Uh, whoever's champion, let's be proud of being champion because you beat the other guy, not because you were the last guy that got knocked down or didn't get knocked down. Did you talk to them at all about any penalties that might be incurred if they keep it up? I told them if they flagrantly took a rider out, that I'd gladly take that race away from him. At 25 points, the championship's over in a hurry. Last question, how did each rider take it? Very good. Uh, they both, uh, they're, they're a pair of little pit bulls. They both smiled, they shook hands, and I said, let's go racing, and that's what we're gonna do. Thanks, Duke. Thank you. So the guidelines are set and fairly clear, David. I think it's a great time for Duke to get in there and prevent this from getting ugly, because these guys, you know, it's, it's gonna keep one up in each other, and when you got this much at stake, I mean, the championship is probably going to equate to about a quarter of a million dollars for these guys, plus replacing the record book. So it's important. Duke Finch, his wife Sony, great experience. As we see the battle between Langston and Ramsey. Langston now fairly easily as Ramsey has problems down there deep in the rut. That was a gutsy move coming from the outside. All Ramsey would have had to do was one more blip of the throttle, and Langston would be parked back there right now. But he knows that he's got to get around. He can't afford to be behind a rider that he's a little bit faster than for any more than a half a lap, or Brown will be gone. The emotions are running high in that mechanics area, Davey. Steve, a much better start for Mike this time. Yeah, it's a great start. And, uh, you know, to make it a little bit better for us is uh, we've got Larry Ward between us, so hopefully uh, we can uh, capitalize with Larry holding uh, Brown back a little bit. I saw the look on Mike's face when he came to the gate. He looks like he's off business. He looks like he was awful upset with what happened at the end of the first moto. Yeah, he was. I mean, you know, Mike gave him a little bit of a nudge up the top of the track here. You know, I'm obviously just disappointed in Grant as well. I mean, Grant didn't need to take him down, but, you know, that's motocross, and hopefully we'll uh, pick up some points out of this one. Larry Ward with a fine season after getting caught up in a numbers game. In Supercross, not having a ride, coming back here with Moto Triple X. Larry Ward with Langston right behind him. It's nice to see the resurgence of his career. You know, I've, I've said it quite a few times this year, but I really admire the way he was able to go out and 
do some other things in his life, you know, and kind of put motocross down for a little while, get his pilot's license, do some hunting, you know, get, get relaxed, recharge his batteries, as McGrath would say, and come back to this with an opportunity to ride a bike that seems to be performing well in this class, and to do as well as he did. To, to be able to win a national in three different decades is pretty darn impressive. DGY also helping out. They help a lot of top privateers out over the years. Larry Ward, number 10, an important factor as far as Mike Brown is concerned. And a longer Brown notices him back there, the better he's going to feel. As soon as Langston can make a pass, if he can, on Ward, I think he can close the gap up to Brown just because he has to. The motivation, he won't be getting that roost off the fourth throw. Larry Ward with a terrific midseason, a second place at Bud's Creek with a 2-2, and then a great victory, overall victory at Red Bud the next week. A little bit of a stumble at Washougal, but then he rebounded with a second place in the second moto. I thought he was going to start another string of good finishes, but... Here goes Langston to the inside. And Grant Langston now in second place, ready for an assault on Mike Brown. Early in the first moto, we saw Mike Brown just shoot by everybody after about a sixth place start. Well, now we get a chance to uh, see the test being put to Grant. I think sometimes that really helps, too, is because you, you get in a position in the beginning of the race where you've just got to ride just out of your mind to get up where you need to be, and then that kind of sets the tone. You're able to ride that pace pretty much the rest of the race. That's what Langston's settled into right now. Brown may have a problem with it. The rivalry is present once again. We'll be right back with more 125 action. Order now. The Chevy Trucks AMA Motocross Series is brought to you by Suzuki, maker of innovative motorcycles and ATVs. This is where the action is, Binghamton, New York, as Mike Brown and Grant Langston battle it out out front. We go back in the pack in a battle for seventh place. Nick Way, Brock Sellers, Way on the Yamaha, Sellers on the KTM. I think it's interesting right now to reflect back, David, a little bit on the uh, the four-stroke situation in the 125s. Everybody thought, hey, you didn't get to the outdoors, look out. But we've got uh, the points leaders on two strokes, Brown and Langston. Well, I have a feeling that if you put the points leaders on a four-stroke, then you'd be looking at four strokes out front. It's just that Kawasaki doesn't make one, neither does KTM in that division. But, you know, I've been back and forth on four strokes. The only thing I don't really like about it is that it's, it is a controversy because of them being in the 125 class. Now, four strokes are great. My son rode one, loved it. I've talked several of my friends into riding one. If I could still ride, I'd probably ride one. O'Mara told me he rode a 426 and loved it. He goes, you could be in any gear anywhere and just have the power to do what you want. It's just that in the future, you know, I'd like to see more four strokes in a separate class for that. As far as right now, it does really... It's difficult to get around a four-stroke. You know, Langston had a little bit of a tough time trying to get around Larry Ward because they make different power in different places. But in the end of a lap, I think it comes out about the same. Four-stroke's better in, in spots, but in others, it, you have to muscle it around a little bit more, as Fonseca has told me before. Our hats off to adjusting to four-strokes, but also the, the riding skill of Grant Langston and Mike Brown on the two-strokes, as well as the power plants they've been supplied from KTM and Kawasaki in the battle for eight. Fonseca, he's only got one podium on the year. That was a Troy, but that, I think, kind of misrepresents his skill as a, as a rider. Two races in a row. Hank on to Mount Morris. He had third place finishes in the first moto and came back with a 35 in the second moto at Hangtown and a 29 at Mount Morris because of motor problems. That'll take you out of the hunt real quick for a podium. This week's Suzuki Flashback takes a look into the future by looking back at this year's Loretta Lynn's Amateur Championships. Suzuki was well represented at this year's event, and among the top up-and-comers was Brock Epler, who swept his class and took home a championship for Suzuki. Another future factory rider is Shane Bess, who rode to a solid second-place finish in the second moto of the 125A class. Here's another familiar name, Davey Millsaps, who finished third in the first moto of the 85cc 9-13 class before a nagging injury forced him to the sideline. 
And Suzuki's Chase Reed took another moto win for his class. To see more of this talented group, head to Glen Helen in San Bernardino, California for the Suzuki RM Cup, September 15th and 16th. Back to live action here in Binghamton, New York. And we come out on a Suzuki, number 32, Roderick Kane. He's doing a pretty good job here in fifth place. Let's check in down to the mechanics area now with uh, Racer X's Davey Coombs. Tony, once again, Hot Rod's right in the thick of it. He's in fifth place with Scott Sheik behind him. Yeah, Scott's knocking on his door pretty hard. I, I'd like to see my guy shake him. Um, he needs to catch Ramsey, and I'm pushing him to try to get Ramsey. At the end of that first moto, it seemed like he got frustrated trying to get around Fonseca. Is that what happened? Yeah, that's what it looked like to me. He was uh, eating a lot of Fonseca's roost, you know. His front end of his bike and his mouth and face was all covered up. So, uh, I don't know. He, he probably needs to be a little bit stronger towards the end of the moto, but uh, he tried hard. It was, was a good effort. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Scott Sheik of Plano Honda right behind Roderick Tain. And he's starting to put some pressure on him. You know, I sure like Berluti's attitude as well. Just, just like Ali. He's been around the sport for a long time, and he recognizes, you know, the, the reality of what Tain can do in this series and in, in individual motos and the amount of effort that he puts out. And he doesn't expect any more than that. You know, sometimes you can get the wrong impression from a mechanic, and I think Tony would be a great mechanic for any rider. Number 105 on the Honda. Scott Sheik making the move to the inside. Can he make it stick on Tane? Yes, Scott Sheik moves up another notch. Let's go to Davey. Now we're watching Scott Sheik. Your rider's put on a very inspired charge to fifth. Yeah, he's been working really hard this year, and... Uh, had a little bad luck here and there, but I think that he's pulling together today. It's his home track, and, uh, you know, he's uh, been wanting to do it. Been working hard. How stoked was he to be coming back to New York? I mean, this is Scotty's home track. Uh, he's always stoked to come back where his friends are at, and, uh, you know, it's made a big difference. He's uh, a different person here. Thanks, Al. Appreciate it. Our leader still Mike Brown with Langston in second place. As we take a look at Sheik, Let's check out our Suzuki trivia question for today. Who's the only Suzuki rider to win three times at Binghamton? Our answer in a moment. Things have changed, and so has Oceanic, breaking new boundaries with exciting new channels like We, Women's Entertainment. It's a new idea, a celebration of all the things women are, a destination station where women can relax, relate, and relief. Times have changed and so have you. We, Women's Entertainment. Coming this September to Oceanic. So They've been running 125s here in Binghamton, New York for 21 years. Which Suzuki rider won three times? Mark Barnett. The first three of four years. It was broken up only by Johnny O'Mara. Yeah, Johnny stole one in 82, I think. That's right. Number nine. I remember I was a teammate that year. That was my first year at Honda. Then the next year he was number four. Just like Carmichael, and he won a championship. So, kind of neat going back to that segment as we watch Brown here. Looks like he's got a great pace going. It's kind of neat to see Johnny riding him. I mean, he looks just, I was there that day watching him. He looks just as good as he always did. Said he was sore the next day, and he doesn't miss that part. Can Mike Brown hold on to the lead against Grant Langston and win? back the three points he lost in the first moto. That's Carmichael, he just passed, point out the outside line, jump all the way down that hill, rail the outside, jump the next plateau. If there's anything on the track that Ricky can point out for him, he will get over there and do it. It's pretty far from the starting line. Mike Brown, a great story. Down 59 points at mid-season. Could be one of the greatest comebacks in 125 history should he win the title. I don't know about you, Art, but I, after he had a couple of those problems, flat tire and a couple of those 38s, I really figured, well, you know, he's going to win some races, but you can forget about the title. It's unbelievable to think that he's still got a shot at it with all the... Oh, oh no! He wants it, gets right back up again. Here comes Langston. Langston has taken over the lead on a mistake by Mike Brown. Well, it's really a wild thing that our points leader, Langston, didn't pick up a point in two motos this season, and the runner-up didn't score a point in three motos. And yet they're still at the top of the list. 
never give up. Perfect example of that. There's his mechanic. He's just received word on the radio that Brown went down. Brown went by one of the pro circuit personnel at the top of the hill right before he fell, as a matter of fact. But he got that word quick. He's going to get into this breaking bump right here. You see he lays it into that. The suspension's going to come back the other way. He's also under braking. That may be why that back end rebounded the way it did. When you get on the brakes, the suspension doesn't work the same. Another look from the top of the hill. He lays it into that bump. Now watch the way he tumbles. He just kind of rolls sideways. There's a whole art to the way that you crash. Now, you know, his teammate, Shea Bentley, obviously doesn't roll right. Every time he falls, he gets hurt. Brown, every time he falls, he gets right back up. He has a presence of mind there to roll sideways, not just stick out a wrist and end up with an injury. Advantage, South African, Grant Langston. Let's go to Davey. Well, Steve, you guys just had another tough break. I know it was over the hill, but in case you haven't heard, Mike crashed. Yeah, I heard over the radio. I mean, we just got to keep going. You know, Grant, anything can happen to Grant. So we just got to keep pushing forward and see what happens out from here on. All right, tough break. Thank you. Meanwhile, Grant Langston is looking to sweep four straight motos like he did at the beginning of the season to take over the points lead. Much more crucial right now. Let's check in with Davey, who's over at the KTM camp. Well, Andrew, suddenly everything has changed again. Uh, Davey, um, when you look at the whole situation, Grant Stad said the same thing. Uh, it's going to come down to the last race, and who's got nerves are still. And uh, Grant was sitting there. I think he was going to look to put a move towards the end, but, I mean, he wasn't even that close, and Brown went down, so uh, obviously he's breaking up under pressure. We got about 10 minutes left. What are you going to tell Grant? Just to focus on the track. There's some nasty breaky bumps out there, and uh, he needs to keep pushing, but he needs to uh, just have a good choice of lines. That sounds awfully harsh, but you know what? I have to agree, Art. In, in the moments that really have mattered the most, coming down to the end, the first moto, Brown going wide, leaving the door open for Langston to come in there and make that pass for the first moto and get those valuable points. And again here, to make a mistake. You know, if he didn't have that pressure right there, he may not have been pushing as hard down that hill. So the, the pressure is on. Maybe that's not what got to him, but it's what you would certainly think. Now Ward loses the front end. He's up quick. Keeps that four stroke running. That's going to help Brown, too. So he's trying to recover from his crash. He had Ward pretty close until Ward made his mistake. He can't afford to lose another two points. What a disappointing day. I mean, he can look back at this and think, man, I had both motos right there in my hand and gave them away. He's led 23 laps today. Now, he'd give up all that if he could lead the last couple. Is it just the last couple corners? You know, that, that's all that matters. You can see he's pushing as hard as he can. Those hay bales are just in the way. Breaking those things apart, trying to get back up there. That just never give up. See, if he pushes hard enough, maybe Langston would make a mistake. He could scoop up that. You never know. Well, luck has its own current, too. And you've got two more motos remaining on the season after this one. Nine points, though, would be if it stays like this. He, even if he won both motos in the final round, that all that Langston would really have to do is just stay nearby. What a big disappointment that crash was. Mike Brown, with his head down, though, tries to come back, and we'll be back in a moment. Second Moto 125 action from Binghamton, New York. This is the 11th round of a 12-round series. And once again, I think we're going to see for the second year in a row the 125 title coming down to the very final race in uh, Delmont, Pennsylvania. Davey? Guys, I want to show you something. Check out the board. One of the Pro Circuit Mechanics putting out this for Casey Lytle. He is going to be lapped by Langston. Put that board out to let him know. Maybe do all he can to slow Grant Langston down. Can't blame him for that. You know, Langston's got teammates out there. And, you know, if you think about it, Brown doesn't really have as much help, but they're going to get a little from Lytle. Congratulations to Larry Ward, able to stay up in third after slipping out. Kept that motor running, got right back on. Well, what really set that up was, you know, besides Larry's been around a while and he rides well, it's... He rode hard in those opening laps to try to stay with Langston and Brown. That opened up such a big gap over fourth. He could afford to fall again and still keep third. Casey Lytle and Langston. Lytle about ready to get lapped. 
Langston. Gosh, a third degree separated shoulder at Southwick. It looked like it would take him out of the running. And doesn't have too hard a time getting by Lytle. Looked like Langston gave him a little break check up there at the top of the hill, a little look over, like, don't even try. I didn't really see Lytle do anything wrong there. And Langston just letting him know, I'm not going to play that. It didn't work for Bonds, and it won't work for any of these other guys either. Brad Langston on his way to another sweep. Well, you can look at it as lucky, or you can look at it as keeping the pressure on and not giving up. I, mean, I can think of a time when this guy had to stay on the sidelines at Bud Creek. That's right. You know, I mean, it didn't look good for him either then. And a key decision not to go for surgery when everybody else was saying, hey, they, they get to it as quick as you can medically. And he came storming back from 44 points down, regain, claiming the points lead after the last race. One more lap. He's got a comfortable lead over Brown. You can see back behind him. He doesn't have the pressure, so he can afford to ride this lap. Careful if he chooses. Still goes for that downhill triple. This will give him a nine-point lead going into the last race of the 125 season. Salutes the crowd. Can't help but think of Houston when he starts doing stuff like that. Looked just about like that, only looking to the other side. That's through the Supercross stuff, too. You might want to save that thumbs up for the checkered flag. This, is, this really matters now. For the second time on the season, Langston has put together two moto sweeps in a row. Before that, it was Brown, wasn't it? The Troy and Washuba. That's right. These guys are hogging all the moto wins, especially with Travis missing. The resolve of these guys is amazing. The problems they've had, the DNFs, and they've worked through all that. Imagine what it would be like if Travis had stayed healthy through this to have a three-way battle going. Travis wouldn't let these guys get away. He'd be right there in the middle of it. Well, when there's a three-man battle, too, you get all kinds of combinations. It makes it real interesting coming down to the end. Just shoot the pit area. You see a lot of stuff on the pit boards if there were three riders involved. You got a lot of teammates out there to affect the outcome. I think it's amazing for this young man from South Africa after winning the 125 GP World Championship. He came quickly to America. He wanted to be where the action was, especially learn more about Supercross rapidly. And to do as well as he has outdoors, it's a great compliment to not only his skills, but also KTM. Look at there, Mike Brown, not that far behind if something should happen to Langston. Well, Langston is cruised this last lap like I thought he might when Brown is ride as hard as he can. He can afford to fall again and still hold off Larry Ward. So he's giving it everything. Langston still saluting the fans though. Looking back to see where Mike Brown is because he wheelies over the finish line. Grant Langston taking the checkers. Mike Brown drops three points more in back of the points leader. He's got to be a very disappointed young man. That's right back to the pits. Skip the interviews. I can understand his frustration right now. Langston, Brown, Larry Ward hangs on to third, but Ramsey moving up to fourth. Scott Sheik rounding out the top five. Time to hear from the winner, Davey. Well, Grant, it has been a very eventful day for you and Mike Brown, but just like the last race, you come out with a 1-1. Yeah, I mean, Mike rode real well today. Today he gave me a, a hard time, and uh, I think our speed was very, very similar. It just depended on who made more mistakes, and, uh, you know, I, I pushed, uh, you know, a little bit towards the sort of the middle there. And I closed on him a little bit, and he made a mistake at the back, and uh, he was kind of just in front of me, and uh, he went down that back hill and just hit some uh, big bumps and got a tank slap and went down. And, uh, you know, after that, I could just cruise because this track's real easy to crash on. And uh, once I had the lead, I just, you know, just kind of took it easy. We're going into the last round. You now have a nine-point lead. You have to feel comfortable with that. But at the same time, with all the contact you guys have been making, that's got to be in the back of your mind as well. I mean, not really. I mean, 
Mark's an aggressive rider. I've raced against him for a few years now, and uh, you know he'll bump you real hard if he gets a chance. And uh, you know, I just got to limit those chances, get by him, and, and and you know, don't allow him to get near me. And uh, I think that's what it'll take. Uh, well, Grant, you're certainly finishing out the year the way you started with those four motor wins before you got hurt. You have to feel good about going into the last round. Yeah, definitely. And you know, at least I got a a bit of a points gap now going to the final round. And uh, you know, so even if he did beat me and I finished behind him, it's still good enough. So. You know, it's kind of peace of mind tonight. I got the little gap. You're right. Thanks a lot. Advantage Langston as he takes the overall here at Binghamton with Mike Brown in second, Larry Ward in third. But like in tennis, even though you take a serve point away from a great player, look out because the other one could come right back. Well, Brown has nothing to lose in the final round, and Langston's got to ride a little bit careful. Sometimes that can be the difference. The Suzuki point standings show us that Langston has that important nine-point lead over Brown with the battle going on still for third place in the 125-point situation. From high stakes emotion to history in the making, let's go to Davey. Well, right over my shoulder is Ricky Carmichael, and that is the man who's got a date with destiny. Carmichael, one moto away from winning what would be his fifth straight national championship. That's never been done before. No one's even won four in a row before. Keep this in mind for the second moto. The guy who was the runner-up, Sebastian Tortelli, is someone that Ricky's got to be clocking for the competition coming up in Belgium next month. That's the Motocross des Nations, a race that Ricky takes very seriously for Team USA. We will be right back with the start of the second 250 moto after this. DirecTV or Dish Network. Welcome back to Binghamton, New York. Ricky Carmichael is on the verge of winning his fifth national motocross title in five years. He's able to pull off the feat today. RC will have clinched four of his five titles right here at Binghamton. The last three years I've been here, I've won a title, so I definitely have that in my head. Um, you know, Kevin rides really good here. I'm taking that into consideration and uh, it's not going to be easy. You know, I, I believe I have to get a good start and try to put the Chevy Trucks Kawasaki up front. I, I, I think I have what it takes to do it. I'm going to carry the momentum I had from last weekend into this weekend. I'm going to give it 100% and try my hardest. And if I win, then I, I win. If I don't, then I'll take it to next weekend. So what about the idea of riding the 125 at Delmont if the title is clinched here at Binghamton? You know, I haven't really thought about it until this week, and everyone's been asking me if I want to, if I want to, and, you know, everyone's just counting on me winning this weekend, but for myself, I, I believe that I have to, I have a job to do, and anybody can be beaten, and I, I don't want to be beaten, and I'm going to do it at whatever in my power I can do to win, and then worry about the 125 class if, if, I, if I wrap the title up this weekend, but uh, I'm not going to make any any choices or decisions until that check and flag flies in the second second moto. You know, I sure like his the way he's approaching all of this. You know, he knows that he can be beaten. He knows that Kevin rides well here and he gives all those guys plenty of credit. I think that, you know, the good head he seems to have on his shoulders as a result of having Johnny O'Mara and uh, good people around him. Not only is Ricky Carmichael looking for his fifth consecutive national title, for five consecutive years, RC will have won at least seven national events during that time if he stays in front of Wyndham. We're off and running. Moto 2, the 250s. Another good break for Carmichael to the inside. There's Dowd to the outside, and Wyndham sneaks in there. Dowd and Wyndham part of bar. Wyndham taking over the lead. Dowd fishtailing right in front of Ricky Carmichael. Whoa! And Barry is in point. Carmichael already just shoving down to the outside, takes over second. He's all over Wyndham now. Kevin on a string of three podiums, a third at Troy, the two-moto sweep win at Washougal, and a third in the last race at Millville. He's headed toward another podium, but he certainly would like to take this moto. Whoa, look at this. Ron Cotter, number 21. You also have Larocco's in that mess, trying to get unhooked from, uh, looks like Jason Thomas. Really thought that once Larocco got on that four-stroke, this is his fourth moto start on that bike. I thought he might be able to pick up his starts and stay out of that mess. Started off riding that CR450F wonderfully well, actually in the first race there at Millville on it, taking a fourth overall. Look at Ricky trying to stay clear of the line and all that roost coming off of Wyndham's bike. 
He's been about that distance from Wyndham. He hasn't been able to get any closer. He just came down that hill so hard, he had to go a little bit wide there, lost some time. You know what, when you watch Wyndham versus Ricky, Wyndham rides a lot more perfect. So when he has to get a little bit squirrely, he backs out of the throttle a little bit. Ricky rides on the edge. He, so when he gets squirrely, he doesn't back out. He's used to that. Carmichael ready to challenge Wyndham here in the second moto of the 250s. See Wyndham wheeling over all the bumps. Ricky's like, the heck with it. I'll hit them all. I don't care. Oh, look at that. Wyndham can feel it. Barry moving up into third, but all the eyes are on this battle out front. Ricky gets on the gas coming out of the corner at the exact same time Wyndham does, so that Wyndham never opens up a gap coming out of the corner. Here comes Carmichael with a long leap, and to the inside. Back and forth we go. Ricky Carmichael has taken over the lead once again. Well, if that doesn't just ruin all your hopes. I don't know what will. He just completely out jumped, landed completely out on the flat, bottomed out, then he hit the front wheel of Wyndham, almost hit it again, trying to cover the inside. Unbelievable. There you see the riders on the summary up above as they cross the finish line. Ron Cotta in 22nd after getting into that pileup. 40 riders in our 250 field. Still never saw LaRocco come through there. Down number 16, Tortelli number 13, battling for fourth. Listen to the way Dowd gets on that power, just kind of rolls it on. There's so much of it. Nice smooth delivery. The fourth photo of the day here in Binghamton, a rough track. We'll be right back with more 250 action. Beckman, David Bailey, Davey Combs in our second moto of 250 action. Ricky Carmichael, once again, like he did in the first moto, taking over the lead before the first lap concluded. Actually, right near the start-finish line this time, as we look back at a fourth-place battle between Dowd and Tortelli. Dowd pushing hard right there. You can see that when he gets on the power, he just kind of rolls it on. You see how much roost that thing throws. So for Tortelli, he's just getting showered with rocks. And when he gets on the power, he's got to clutch it and give it everything he's got to try to get up to speed and try to close the gap that Dowd opens. Did you really see it coming over that hill? Oh, look out! Tortelli goes flying. Oh, that was not good. He, he face planted hard. It's not quite as bad as what happened to him in Troy, but he looks pretty stunned. Tortelli has had some of the most spectacular crashes consistently I've seen since I've been covering Supercross and Motocross. Yeah, you just hate, I didn't really see what he did to deserve that kind of a crash. Really not that many bumps there. Dad went through there smooth. Credit the volunteer flagman too, getting right out there on the job. Yeah, they're taking a little bit of chance. Those guys are coming over a blind hill. So they're out there in the middle to protect Portelli. Here's our leader, Ricky Carmichael, and look at the lead he's opened up already. Well, I think he just ruined, you know, it, all the confidence of, of Wyndham. I mean, when you get passed like that, plus for Wyndham, it's like, what is he riding for here? You know, the title's gone for Shane Drew, Portelli's mechanic. Oh, he hit his head hard. When he, when he got sideways like that, he just got spit off. He didn't even have time to reach out or do anything to brace that ball. He just, here it is again. He gets a little sideways, and the back end swaps the other way, and bam. Yeah, that was a, that was a hard impact right there. Villeman saw the whole thing. Back end slides out and kicks all the way the other way. He didn't even have a chance, and he hit his head so hard lucky that they've got so much of that loam on this track. Now watch when Dowd comes through. His rear wheel is going to hit a bump. See that little bit of dirt right there? It kicks up. Now when Tortelli gets there, that's what started his problems. But the back end swaps so far the other way. I, that surprises me. I know it caught him by surprise. And then the face plant. 
Well, you see on that shot why there's so many arm, hand, and shoulder injuries as he tried to tuck them in as quick as he could. That was just such a surprise that he was actually, it was kind of good because it was so loose. Here comes Villeman to the inside of Dowd. Villeman with one win on the season. And that was back at Mount Morris on the third round. Dowd getting caught up in the corner there, giving Villeman the advantage. Just trying to do anything to get back in there and fight. I like that about Dowd. You know, he'll get past, he doesn't just give up at that. He'll try to get back up in there and test the guy and see if he really wants that pass bad enough. Sometimes you, you get by somebody and you relax a little bit. If they come back by, it takes you forever to get them again. In the last two races, Villeman has placed fourth in the second moto in both of them. We'll see if he can hold on once again. Roadrunner is good because you have a tremendous amount of power. I can get phone calls while I'm online. It's a great high-speed internet service. Everyone knows the bird. I can be online and my phone still rings. Lots of power. Boom. Boom. Easy as that. That's a good thing. Anybody who has Roadrunner <laughs> is pretty much way ahead of the game. The idea makes pretty good sense to me. Get free installation now through September 30th. Call Oceanic today. It's a good thing. If you got Roadrunner, you got a pretty normal life. Beep, beep. Hawaii's newest local yellow pages are here. The Paradise Pages. Larger text, more vibrant colors. Makes it easier to find everything you're looking for. Every month, we'll ask you a question about what's inside the Paradise Pages. Answer it right, and you could win lots of trips and prizes from these fine companies. That's right, you get your prize at Paradise. Here's the leader, defending champion, Ricky Carmichael, who's looking for his seventh win this season. And in doing so, would take the crown home once again. He's had a phenomenal season, David. Mount Morris was his worst overall with a fifth-place finish. And that was a 13th in the first moto coming back to win the second moto. He's won 12 motos this year. Let's go down to the pit area now with Davey Coombs. Chad, that was one impressive move he made on Kevin Wendham. I think my bike's about three feet longer after a landing like that. Is that something you guys have talked about? Did he know he could make a fast there? Not really. I think that was the heat of the moment passion deal, you know. Go for it or don't go for it at all. With the thing you got at stake right now, this national championship, you worry about something like that. I mean, he must have gone 100 feet flat wheel landed. Now, as long as my wheels don't break, I mean, this ain't his first rodeo. People always freak out when the rear end passes the front end, and he may swap, but that's the kid's style. I mean, if he all wide open the whole time, then he's not comfortable, so let him do what he wants to do. Not his first rodeo. That's a good one. You know, you can count on Chad for the funny stuff. And here it is again. Watch Carmichael just flies to the flat while Kevin's over there leaving the door open, hitting the downside, doing everything right. Right there, it didn't matter. Carmichael just went faster for the pass and clipped his front wheel in the process. I think Kevin's just going, you know what, if you want it that bad, I just don't know if I want to take that many chances at the end of the season with the motocross the nations coming up. You can't win the title anymore, pretty much. So I think Kevin at this point has just decided to play a little bit smart and not give it to Ricky, but when he passes you like that, it definitely ruins your confidence. Earlier we heard Johnny O talking about the, the new bikes for a Honda. What if they'd have had suspensions like that in your day? Well, we would have gone a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> and if the tracks were this nice, we would have gone even faster still. You know, the, the tracks we rode on here, where there was so much dust, you wouldn't be able to see that very well. You'd have to go, is that Kevin Wyndham? And wait till they got closer. Things have changed. But the power I think we had was about what they have today. We had a lot of power back then. Kevin Wyndham, number 14. Still might have the honor, though, of being a runner-up in the 250 points chase. Second place in points would be the best Suzuki finish since Alby's championship at 99. But I think more so it, uh, it shows us what Kevin Windham has inside himself in coming back during this motocross season. You know, we look at his entire year, Supercross, I'm sure he would like to have done better here and there, but this is the whole season. He's been healthy and he's had strong performances, his best outdoor season, going over for the motocross nations. I think, you know, you look at individual motos like this he's probably disappointed that he couldn't get up there and fight with ricky a little bit more but overall it's, it's pretty good it definitely it builds some steam heading into next year this is his first year getting used to the new bike so i would expect him to be 
fighting a lot more next year and, and probably make up the difference in speed. These two have been at it for quite a while. John Dowd and David Villeman. Another big difference in styles and in power plants. Jeff Dowd with all that horsepower and Villeman with all that finesse, the way he hops around the track. Barry, all alone, a lonely ride in third right now. Let's check in with Davey Combs. Any new information, Davey? Well, guys, with Sebastian Tortelli sitting on a hay bale over there, take this into consideration. Going into the 2001 Motocross Des Nations next month, Team France was the team most likely to challenge the USA with Tortelli, new world champion Mikel Pichon, and also the Ricci Segui. Well, right there, you're seeing France's MVP sitting this one out. He's talking to Dr. Steve Augustine. Tortelli has had another concussion earlier this year. We saw that big get off that he had at Kenworth. This, this does not bode well for the French team at the Motocross Des Nations. Does this give the uh, favorites roll to the Belgians on their home track? Well, you know, Stefan Everts is going to be fast, but I'm just not sure if his supporting cast is going to be up to the task of competing with Wyndham, Carmichael, and Brown. we got a really strong team there, so I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't win that again. It's going to be exciting. I can hardly wait. John Dowd, David Billiman still going at it. Trucks AMA Motocross is brought to you by Chevy Trucks, the most dependable, long-lasting trucks on the road. And by Honda, the company that defines performance in motorcycles, ATVs, and scooters. Predictions for greatness started early for this young lad from Florida, setting records at Loretta Lynn's. He then met the expectations of others entering the professional ranks. 25, 125 motocross victories and three titles. But could he beat Jeremy McGrath in Supercross and continue his brilliance in the 250 ranks? He answered that this year. With today's victory, he passes Jeremy McGrath with his 16th 250 motocross victory. And at the same time, caps his second 250 outdoor championship. Kevin Windham taking second, Ferry third, Villeman holding on to fourth, and John Dowd rounding out the top five. Time now for that exciting moment for Ricky Carmichael. Let's go to Davey. Well, Ricky, once again, congratulations. You got yourself another number. Thanks a lot, Davey. I tell you, it feels good. Uh, it's been kind of a, a rougher outdoor series than I'm used to. Uh, Bridgestone Tires got me out to great starts today. I, I can't complain at all. Chevy Trucks Kawasaki is running really good, and uh, I'm just so proud of the way the uh, year went with the Supercross title and, uh, of course, the outdoor title. And uh, only got one more left, and that's to go to uh, Belgium and, and, and show those guys that America is the best. Well, speaking of titles, I'm going to bring Duke Finch from the AMA in right now. And Duke, I think you have something for Ricky. Yeah, Ricky, congratulations on defense of your title. We're proud to have you as a champion, and right, we'll get the donations back again. Thanks a lot, Duke. Feels great to be able to hold that number one plate up. You got the, all the photographers, friends, people you've known over the years, and it, it feels a lot different when you wrap it up before the last round versus what Mike Brown and Langston are up against. Hey, one other thing, I think your mechanic, Chad Watts, had something for you, too. <laughs> Ricky, you guys have become the first team since Jeff Emick, 1997, to win both the outdoor title and the Supercross title. I'll tell you, Davey, it was... Uh... They had me scared there for a while. Things weren't going too good. And uh, after Washugo, I had the chance to go to uh, California and, and test some, some better motor stuff. And uh, I tell you, with the performance of the last two weeks, uh, I think this thing's running really good. And I'm back to my old self. And, you know, I, I wasn't winning by 20 seconds, and everyone thought I was washed up. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to go out with a bang. And uh, I don't know, maybe next weekend I'll uh, try to beat Bomber's record. <laughs> Thanks, Ricky. Nothing much different with the top three for the overall here after the two motos of action. Carmichael, Wyndham, and Ferry with Dowd, and Stefan Rancata rounding out the top five. For Kevin Wyndham, his fourth podium in a row. Davey? Kevin, that was another good, strong moto. Better than the first moto, even, but it was second overall. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I guess there's a light behind every cloud, you know, and it, the, the second moto was better, but obviously still not good enough, you know, and uh, 
first and foremost, just you know, like to like to congratulate Ricky on a, a great year, you know, all the way around both championships, and uh, you know, he's riding good today, you know. And so, uh, you know. It's nice to be up there in, in the top, you know, but I, I lose sight of, of how good second and third may be because, uh, you know, we're just kind of all right here in Ricky's game. You know, it seems to be his game this year. and uh, But that's good because it determines, it gives me a lot of determination. And uh, got a lot of days here in between now and uh, the start of two. So, you know, just go back to the drawing board and uh, study the tapes and, and watch his style and uh, try to pick up on some things and come out blazing for O2. Here's the Suzuki point standings with one more round left on the schedule. Carmichael, Wyndham, Ferry, LaRocco still have a good battle going on for third, maybe. Villeman, Dowd, Roncada, Raynard, and Kyle Lewis in the top ten. The 125's a big disappointment for Mike Brown crashing out of the lead. Grant Langston sweeping the motos here today. Brown still with a chance for that championship with one more round remaining. Let's go back to Davey. Mike, I'm sorry I missed you right off the racetrack. What happened? Oh, I got the good start, you know. I passed, passed everybody the first lap, got in the lead, and, you know, had a pretty good lead. I was pulling away from second place there and felt comfortable. Went over the back side over there. It's kind of soft. And I was kind of on the edge of the, you know, the track right there, and it, my friend went off to the edge and just, you know, went over the bars. Got up, and I was in second still, and just, you know, I don't know if I didn't think I'd really catch him, but I rode my hardest just to say, I, you know, I feel better when I got done. But, yeah, I caught up a little bit there and, you know, ended up second, you know, three more points back. What are you going to do at Steel City? I know today had to be a frustrating day being out in front in both motos. Now you need some help. Yeah, I don't know. Just go there and win both motos, you know. I think I feel I should have won two today and I would have been ahead, but it's over now and go to next week. Just all I can do is win and um, hopefully some people finish in between that. Tough break, Mike. What would really make things interesting would be Ricky Carmichael on a Kawasaki going back to the 125s in the final race of the season to break the tie with Mark Barnett, each with 25, 125 career motocross victories. Well, of course, to break that, he's got to win the race, but look at the battle that Langston and Brown have. It's no secret that Carmichael has helped Brown all summer, and that he could be the one that could provide the help that Davey was talking about. Brown needs it, and Carmichael could be the guy, but he can't do that and win the race. A fascinating way to end the 2001 motocross season. Art Eckman for David Bailey, Davey Coombs, thanking you for being with us. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more information, log on to ESPN.com.